everyone and welcome to another Scots Way podcast and today I'm going to be talking to uh, writer Graham McRae Burnett. Hello Graham. Hello sir, thanks for having me. Um, thanks for joining us again because uh, we last time we spoke to you I think it was just after the publication of your second novel, um, His Bloody Project. Yeah. And I think it's fair to say quite a lot has happened to you in that book since then. I've had quite a year, <laughs> definitely, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're going to talk about that um, uh, later on, hopefully. But I'd like to start with um, talking about your new novel, The Accident, on the A35, um, which is a sequel to your first novel, The Disappearance of uh, Adele Bedeau. So tell us a little bit about The Accident on the A35. Um, well, The Accident on the A35, it tells the story of an accident on the A35, which is out the road between Strasbourg and Saint Louis, which is where both novels are set in France. Um, and it's really um, at the end of The Disappearance of Adele Bedeau, as you probably remember, um, I had this device whereby I pretended that the novel had been written by a uh, cult French author called Raymond Bruni, yeah. and I had merely translated the translated the novel. Um, and Raymond Bruni's father, as we learn in the afterward to that first book, was killed in an accident on the A thirty five. Um, so the new book is really Raymond Bruni's sort of fictional exploration of the events surrounding the death of his own father. Yeah. Um, so it feels much more to me like a Raymond Bruni book. So I'm I'm writing almost in his persona, right? Um, um but you know the, my or the, the detective character George Gorsky makes a return, yeah. Um, and he gets involved in trying to find out where the victim of this accident has been on the night that he dies. So that's the kind of setup of the book. That's interesting. So in your head, it's not so much that this is another George Gorsky novel. Yeah. More. It's a Raymond Bruni novel. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, um, I think with Adele Bedeau, there was an element, when I was writing the book, I, want, I, was, I was conscious that I would have been translating the dialogue of the characters because they would have spoken to each other in, Fran- in French. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted, because I'm a huge Simenon fan and I read a lot of sort of European literature and translation, and I, I often feel that there's certain texture that translations have, particularly ones of a certain period. And I was trying to give the book that feeling of slightly, slightly dated feel, mid twentieth century mm-hmm. feel, and used self consciously used uh, language and vocabulary that seemed appropriate to that era. So th- just to take it a little bit further, to add in the dimension, it was actually written by a French author. Um, th- that idea really came at the end of writing that book, um, when I was with the accident it was very much part of the conception of the book that this was a book that, that Raymond Bruni was writing or would have written about these events. And, uh, which, you know, in some ways doesn't really make that much difference, but it makes a, um, I mean, I went back to, um, I went back to San Louis before I started writing it to do some research, research which basically involved sitting in cafes yeah. um, and uh, <laughs> drinking and drink, drinking lots of coffee and the odd beer. I was going to ask why you return to these characters, and yeah. I thought, oh, the research, that'll be Yeah, that's it. Well, it's a great way to do research. Um, and I'd been to San Louis, the town where the no- both novels are set, and I'm, I'm quite un- unkind about the town in the first book. And I'd been there twice, uh, both in the depths of winter, and that part of France is in the Alsace, right in the Swiss border. It's very cold in, in the middle of winter. The town is, it's not a remarkable town by any means. And it seemed very grey and unappealing, and I describe it as such in the in the book. But when I went back to do the research for the new book, it was uh, June and it was 30 degrees, blossom was on the trees, there were flowers in the street, there's a lovely canal that you can walk walk along. And I was like, oh, uh, actually this town is really quite pleasant. I thought I'm, I need to be uh, a lot nicer about it in the new book. But and I realised I'm writing in the persona of Raymond Bruni, mm-hmm. and he is a character... In, within the book, in a way, who is trapped in San Luis. So he resents this mm-hmm. town. So he can't suddenly be nicer about, about the town. Uh, so, I mean, in a way, it, it impacted in that kind of way. Interesting. Because so, he's yeah. never a tourist. No, Where, no, you know, no. He's a visitor. Yeah, absolutely. Like yeah. 
Um, but there was a little bit of guilt, perhaps, about how you'd... I think, um, the first. I think if um, some uh, somebody from France or any other country spent a few hours in Kilmarnock, mm. my hometown... And then, on certain days, definitely. Well, the well most days in Kilmarnock, to be honest. <laughs> And then wrote a novel about it in which they describe it as a sort of nondescript backwater. Even although I might think that's true, you feel a little bit offended when an outsider points it out. Um, so I did feel a, I did feel a little bit guilty about it. And I do feel a little bit guilty about it. Um, but by the same token, there's a long history of people writing books which, um, you know, they're, they're, they're not particularly pleasant about the town or city yeah, where the book's set. Um, I just think it's a little bit different when you're not from that place and people sure. sort of bristle a little bit and they feel chauvinistic about where they come from. So it's okay for me to make a disparaging remark about Kilmarnock, but if you did... Yeah, <laughs> I'd, be really, I'd be like, "What are you talking about, pal?" Um, exactly. Yeah, um, we all have our uh, but, uh, relationships yeah. with our old. Yeah, I, I had my I had my first uh, email from a, a resident of San Luis recently, and I opened it with a feeling of dread. Um, but basically, he said, "You captured our town perfectly," and I replied saying, "That's very kind of you because you know I'm not very not very kind about your town." He said, basically said, "Yeah, we we know it's not um, it's not." If, if you did yeah. get kind of a negative response, could you use that um, excuse that I think a lot of um, comedians sometimes use? Could you say, well, it's not me, you see, it's the character who's writing it. Well, I, I don't, I, I can absolutely use that excuse because it's actually my, my <laughs> fictional author, Raymond yeah. Bruni, and in the afterword to the new book, I actually say, um, San Luis is by no means as unpleasant as Raymond <laughs> Bruni describes it. Yeah. Uh, so that is there, so that I can point to it if I ever have to have to go back to San Luis again. But I mean, what's bizarre? I mean, when, when I was writing Adele Bado, I mean, I never, I never really thought it would get published at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. I certainly didn't think it would be published in France, and it's about to be published in France. So that's going to a. It's a quite an interesting thing for the translator to yes, translate my translation back mm -hmm. into. The original language, in a way, um, but it'll be interesting to see how it goes down in San Luis. Well, um, I think it was interesting because when I came to, to read the accident, I always think when I read um, any sequels, what would someone coming to this to these mm. books for the first time would they have to have read yeah. the previous ones? And I don't think, I mean, I think you you know if you haven't, you should because you mm. get this, exactly what you're talking about the different layers and the the continuation between them, but actually, I still think you could come and say, "Oh, this is there's some fictionalizing of the author himself," but mm -hmm. you can get right into the story. Yeah, I mean, uh, the story wise, it's completely self contained, but I think yeah. you know it is trying to strike that balance whereby the book has to stand alone, and I think um, most publishers would be reluctant to publish a book that depended completely on having read a previous book. Um, mm -hmm. And by, so, by you know, in, in Adele Bado, I, you know, I, I have, there's a reasonably long description of the town quite near the beginning of the book, a couple of pages where I set out what it's like, or what Raymond Bruni thinks yes, it's like, yeah. I should say. Um, but so you can't just repeat the descriptions, and that goes for descriptions of the characters who've reappeared mm -hmm. as well, but you need to, as well, be conscious that there are readers coming to the book for the first time, and... They need to know know a little bit, so you you have to feed in a little bit of information. I mean, I'm not planning. I mean, I'm planning to write a trilogy, mm -hmm. so it's not going to be a long running series. Ah, that's so, one of my questions because to me it feels uh, like it could be a long running. Yeah, series. I just, I just, I mean, I was really the reason I wrote this book was primarily because I wanted to go back to that mm. setting. I love the milieu of the, these books, and I like being in it imaginat imaginatively. And I felt that Gorsky was a character. He, he kind of enters Adele Bado about a third of the way mm. through and becomes one of the the two main characters. Um, so he kind of moves centre stage in this book. Um, but yeah, I felt I could do more with that character. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's as I mean, I've often said, you know, the character is everything to yeah, me. Yeah. You know, and so although there are, of course, story and plot in the books... To me, it's a, it's a really what interests me is what impact the events of the story have on the characters and how the characters shape the events of the story, rather than the story being an important thing in itself. 
Yeah. You know, I don't. I don't plan out the story or know what's going to happen. I think yeah. again, it's interesting um, because having spoken to other crime writers who mm. you know who very much it's plot driven. Yeah. And they say, mm. well, I couldn't even start a book before mm. I knew exactly where it was going to end. And well, like this is this is what's interesting. Yeah. You talk to other writers. Exactly. You know, there, there's everybody has their own way of going about it. Some people, I mean, I I know. I know a crime writer who who claims to have planned out a whole cycle of eight novels, you know, and got, he's got that long narrative arc. And I'm, it's like, I mean, I'm like just open mouthed in sort of <laughs> shock if somebody could do that. And uh, you know, I absolutely don't think there's a correct way to do no, it. No, no. But um, I I struggle tremendously even with the plots in my own books and the sort of. I think for non-writers, the idea that putting the events in the correct order, mm-hmm. you would think that might be one of the easiest thing, or it would be very obvious. But that's the thing I struggle most with. Mm. And um, the reason I don't want to plan out the plot is because I want the characters, if a certain event happens in the novel, their reaction to that event will shape the, the subsequent events of the book. Um, so until I sort of... I know who the characters are, mm-hmm. then I can't know what's going to happen in the story. Um, and, you know, I knew who Gorsky was because I'd already written about him, so I can put him into a situation. I know what he'll say, more or less, yeah. and I know how he'll behave. I know what will make him feel aggrieved or, you know, happy or whatever. Whereas with the other central character in this book, who's a 17-year-old teenager, mm-hmm. Sartre-loving teenager... Yes. Um, you know, I didn't when I started writing that character. I didn't really know, you know, what's he like, how unpleasant is he, how pretentious is he, is he pretentious, or is he just an ordinary kid, you know? So I had to work that out through a sort of process of yeah. writing and rewriting, and I would start writing certain scenes, and I didn't really know what he would say because I didn't know his, I didn't know the character at that point. So mm-hmm. it was kind of toing and froing about the process. I think it's that's uh, really interesting comparing those two characters in particular because mm. I think one um, Gorsky is a, an older man. Mm-hmm. Um, you learn a little bit more about him. Mm-hmm. You learn relationships which haven't worked so well, and all, yeah. and where you get the young uh, Raymond mm-hmm. who. He doesn't know, I think, what he's going to say or what he's going yeah. to think. He's in this real kind of um, learning process, and I think that's really it really uh-huh. worked. It maybe wouldn't have worked with someone who wasn't his age or roundabout. Yeah, that well, age. I mean, it's one of the interesting things for me, and and this is it's completely not de- deliberate. But all three of my books feature a seventeen-year-old boy, mm-hmm. or in the in the first book, where there are flashbacks to where the central character Manfred Bowman is. 15, 16 ish, so that sort of late teenage years, Roddy McRae and his bloody project mm-hmm. is a 17 year old boy. Yeah, I forgot um, that, yeah. And it is this, this, yeah, as you say, there's a difference between being on that sort of cusp of adulthood and being an older, you know, mid, late 40s man like uh, George Gorsky. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think um, for Raymond Bartlemy, um, as opposed to Raymond Rooney, uh, you know the death of his father at the beginning of the, on page one of the book is a kind of it's, he he feels kind of liberated by it and um, there's a sense of the the shackles have been taken off so he he's able to behave in ways that he previously wouldn't have dared to yeah um, and you know that was that's that's something you kind of realise it's happening after you've written certain scenes sure. as opposed to thinking this is how he's going to understand the situation. Uh, but then he starts, he goes off to, he, he begins his own sort of investigation uh-huh. as well. So there's, there's these two investigations it, going on in parallel. It's funny, it's, there's no doubt that it's, it's driven by the characters because, you know, you've got this accident at the beginning, but as you start to get involved with the characters, you almost forget that that accident's yeah. happened. Because you're like, oh, well, what, how's this relationship going to work out? And what's he going to discover when yeah. he meets these people? And even, yeah. you know, you've got these kind of set two central characters, but all the other characters are, are equally as memorable. Oh, that's, like, you know, Raymond's mother is a fantastic yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. creation. Uh, yeah, and, um, a, you know, even think like, like Barman or other people yeah. that Raymond goes on to meet, you just think, yeah, okay. You can see they have to be as real for the reactions yeah. to kind of ring true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, something I just, I think it's that, I mean, uh, you know, trying to achieve sort of good writing is, 
especially because I, I write through a sort of scent controlling consciousness, so we see the world through the eyes of the characters, and you. Could, so I would, yeah, I never enter the mind of another character in, in a scene, um, but and that makes that limits somehow um, what we can learn about the other characters. We can only know what Raymond knows or what Gorsky knows, mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know. At the same time, I always try to invest these kind of secondary characters with something, you know, to bring them alive a little bit. Um, so it's nice to hear that that you've responded to that. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about Raymond because uh -huh. to me he, uh, he he kind of reminded me of um, characters from Camus or from mm -hmm. Rocky or these kind of um, the. The inaction is almost as important as the action. It's like almost overly thinking, how should I act? How should yeah, I yeah. react? Yeah. And in, in some ways doing nothing. Um, and, you know, he he gets a knife, which he's going to carry about with him, and, yeah. you know, which makes you think, well, has he ever been do anything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what was... was it, they were these deliberate kind of ideas that you thought you would put into this character. In terms of these references to yeah, in terms of references um, to existential um, there's not there's not there's not any deliberate allusions, although there are a few little allusions in the book, but they're not important that people no. would you know I, I don't I don't like that idea of allusions, which kind of privilege a reader who gets the joke, sure, and you know a reader who doesn't get the joke is kind of left out. Um, I mean, I think if I mean, I I I don't disagree that Raymond is in that the tradition of those characters, and the reason he is in the tradition of those characters is because these are the kind of books I like. And, yeah. You know, uh, I think you know, Young Adam is a great Scottish novel. Yeah. Um, you know, L'Etranger, like like Raymond Bartholomew. When you know, I was a teenager, I read Camus, and or at least read L'Etranger, and then mm -hmm. uh, you know, it had a, a huge impact on me. And these characters who are sort of very outwardly blank and um, almost sort of soci sociopathic in yeah. their um, relationship with other people and uh, they seem well, alienated and, you know, ill at ease um, and they have you know, this idea that they are acting and performing or being inauthentic. Yeah, I mean, at the very um, beginning when uh, uh, Raymond first learns of his father's death, mm -hmm. I mean, what a terrible thing, one of the worst things anyone could ever learn. Yeah. You, you almost get him saying, "How should I?" Act? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I but act? I think, I mean, but then I, I suppose I personally feel these these kind of thoughts. You know, oh, yeah, absolutely. How, how do I? Uh, I, I, I have that. a strong perception of how people are perceiving my behaviour, yeah. and do I meet their expectations or do I not? And in these sort of very stressful situations where Raymond's being told by a cop that his father's been killed in an accident, and actually. You know, he doesn't feel what he thinks he should be expected to feel, which is terrible grief. He feels this feeling of, you know, uh, liberation sort of thing. Which, and again, I think the sort of feeling about, like, teenage boys, that they are a bit sort of psychopathic and, you know, they're, you know, it's a, you know not fully... They're self-centered, and you see the world purely. This is really unfair on teenage boys. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a big audience of teenage boys? I don't know. Uh, I'm sure the teenage boys who listen to you to the, your podcast are not like that at all. No. And it's probably just that I was like that. Um, but uh, yeah, he doesn't behave. He doesn't know how to behave. Yes. And so he has to. He has to think how he should behave. And of course, as soon as you think how should I behave, then. Yeah. How you behave is not is inauthentic, no, you know, yeah. and um, we go back to that sort of existentialist vocabulary of, uh, you know, in acting in bad faith or yes. um, being, you know, authentic or inauthentic, and then then that leads to a kind of alienation between how you behave and how you how you actually think and a sort of dissonance maybe. Yeah, um, and then when that happens, there it's a difficult thing to get out of as a person but it's a difficult thing to get out of I think when you're writing a character as well yeah yeah because the, the character has to once they've started to behave in that way they then have to continue to behave in that way in order to keep up the facade I think um, um, as well it's that time where things are I don't know if mean felt more keenly but mm. um, perhaps reactions are not commensurate with what you're you know either they're too small or they're too large or because you just yeah. don't have the Vocabulary, I suppose, yeah. and, and and to to deal with it, and yeah. and then you've got this 
you know, someone like Gosky, who is now fairly world weary, I think it's mm-hmm. fair to yeah, say, yeah. who actually is dealing with, I mean, some equally traumatic yeah. things along the way, but, you know, uh-huh. perhaps it's too much the other way. Well, I think when you're when you're young, you, you have a very extreme reaction to, yeah. you know, small, you know, emotional disruptions and... You know, when you're older, you're able to take a bit more balanced view and say, oh, it's okay, I'll feel, I'll get over mm-hmm. it in a week, you know. Um, or, you know, you can just put it to bed a little bit more easily and you're not so uh, driven maybe by your emotions and emotional reactions to things. Um, yeah. And I, I don't want to give any in, in a way, but um, there are other right. um, characters that uh, Raymond in particular, you know, comes into contact with. And it's just such a great reminder of I think that age where, you know, the idea of wanting to impress, yeah. you know, someone and <laughs> uh, going way over the top and getting way too drunk and getting, you know, it brought back all sorts yeah. of terrible memories. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, absolutely. But I think, you know, I mean, yeah, Raymond, you know, he, he has a sort of girlfriend in my house, uh, named San Luis, where he lives. And, uh, you know, he meets these other characters and his adventures in the big city of Malus, which is, you know, 10 miles away from San Luis. Um, and he's kind of out of his depths, and yeah. um, he does drink too much. And uh, but you know, it's uh, I I think I I always like the sort of very simple plot line in books of like people arranging a date, yeah, and whether that other person will turn up for the date, and then you know the girl doesn't turn up for the date, and you feel the character feels really crushed. But and you know, it's, I think it's a great you know I just find that a sort of engaging stories and I, and I love the fact you that know. he, he you know, would go to places with his copy of um, Sartre in his pocket <laughs> uh, and it just reminded, reminded me I think of having a copy of On the Road yeah yeah, yeah. exactly fact, yeah you know yeah. kind of um, or like I suppose the, the equivalent of having an album on your arm or whatever totally yeah you know. it's like his little sort of um, it's he he, he it's almost a sort of little guide to living for him. Yeah. And um, you know, he's trying to he's he's not he's not so bright. You know, his other friends are all brighter than him and he kind of knows that. And he's kind of struggling with this book which he thinks is really profound. And it's not the the Sartre book isn't in the in the book in no. order for me to endorse it as a no. sort of <laughs> you know, um, a manual, a life a user's <laughs> manual sort of thing. But I think to Raymond it kind of is. And uh, he's trying to grapple with the questions that Sartre's characters are grappling with. Whether, I mean, in the writing of the book, um, there was a moment where um, I was up north um, and I had a week or more and it was in the winter and a dark, dark night. You've got some time to think. And, you know, there there was a particular moment where I kind of thought, look, if I want to have my character sitting reading The Age of Reason, I bloody well have my character <laughs> reading the age of reason because you kind of feel that some some readers may f- find this quite risible, mm-hmm. and um, but that that thing is that's what I want to write about, yeah. and um, you know it's it's um, it's real for Raymond, I, you know? and I think and, it um, absolutely fits the character, yeah, yeah. perfectly. Um, and I had I you know I, I enjoyed I had a bit of fun with that, and um, I've been now that I've done a couple of events for the book and I've read the scene where Raymond is, we first meet Raymond, he's reading The Age of Reason mm-hmm. and people seem to find it really funny. <laughs> uh, but in a good way, you know, I was like, okay, this is good because it is actually quite, it's quite funny yeah. and there's, yeah, a, there's yeah. a humour in this um, which I don't think detracts from taking the book seriously. No. Um, but it's nice when people respond in any way and, uh, you know, it's sort of affectionate laughter or the laughter of recognition that this sort of rather pretentious young man. Yeah, because mm. it, it, it's serious and you should take him seriously, mm. but it also reminds you of the times where mm. you think, well, that I was similar to that, yeah, or, yeah. you know, and, and I suppose there, but for the grace of God, it could, it could have gone more serious, it could have gone yeah. taking a different turn. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you say now there's definitely going to be a trilogy, is that right? Well, that is not my... I, I, um, I can say a hundred percent that I would. There will not be a series of right. of, of Raymond Bruni books. Um, I mean, it's even set up in the preface to this book um, that there were two further manuscripts. Yeah. Um, and it's also the. Um, I think. I mean, talking about you know lo- other er, cr- long running crime series. I mm. think those can exist because uh, the the writer. And puts their character in the situation of a new narrative. Yeah. So they're, they're really about here's a, here's a case for my detective, yeah. and you know that's not 
to do that kind of thing down because you can bring in all sorts of social issues or topical yeah. issues, etc. I can't remember um, you mentioned it last time, but you know, I was used to be a big fan of the McBain books. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. Where it was all characters, yeah. you know, very, well, uh-huh. lots of different ones, but that's yeah. basically what happened. Yeah. A bit like I suppose some of the Hill Street Blues, where you, yeah. you know, different situations yeah. every time. Yeah. So, but I mean, so because I'm, I'm, I really care about the characters. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying other writers don't, but what I care about is the characters. So, although there are, there are, there is a narrative in both of these French books, um, it's about what the narrative does to the characters. So, um, I, I feel. This, the trilogy will be about Gorski rather than yeah. just giving him new stories. Um, I guess the reason I thought this, if you you know, could have been a series is down to Gorski because I yeah. think this is this a great character, and I know. Um, I mean, you've said it before how much you're influenced by Georges Simenon, yeah. and he wrote. Yeah, I mean, he was seventy five, I think. <laughs> Magri books. Seventy five Magri books. Yeah, I mean, obviously. Well, yeah, I mean, but you know, he also wrote his books in eleven days, yeah. and. Um, you know, it's just uh, uh, it's. I think there's the the other thing about trilogy is it has a it has a kind of unity, and so when I get round to writing the third one, uh, I want it to have some sort of way of bringing it, bringing together the the three books. I mean, in some way, I don't know how I'm going to do yeah. that yet, um, but there's something pleasing about that, and um, I yeah, I just I don't think I could retain enough interest. Um, to continue, or or I would feel I was repeating myself, and you know it's like the town. Um, yeah, I've I've been in the t- I've you know been imaginatively in the town. I've described the town. You know how many times can I do that? Yeah, you know sure. it's um, so. As I said before, I really enjoyed being back there, but I don't want to just string something out just because I created a character that. You know, could you could I could give them new cases to mm-hmm. deal with. It's just it doesn't excite me. Right. Okay. You know, and uh, you know, it, it takes long enough to write a novel. I think if you're not really, really fired up by the idea, um, you know, you'll probably fall by the wayside. Um, and I think it might show yeah. in the writing yeah. as well. I can um, understand that. Yeah. Um, so as you say, Simonon's known mainly for Magri books, but wrote mm. many others. Um, if you are coming to Simonon and a site a Magri aside, would uh-huh. you have any recommendations? Um, well, I always recommend the non Magri books because um, they are the ones I enjoy most. I mean, right. I think the the Magri books are Magri is a great character, and they're always or the standard of the quality of writing is amazingly consistent given mm-hmm. the number of books he wrote. And there's a, they're always full of these um, brilliant descriptions of cafes and bars and canals and all that stuff. But I just I, I personally prefer the the Roman duo as they were called, uh, just because I think because they're self contained. I think they tend to focus on the psychology of the central character, whether they're a criminal or not, which yeah. they're not always. Um, I, the ones I, I tend to recommend are the Blue Room, which mm-hmm. is a kind of about an affair in a provincial town. Simonon is brilliant on provincial towns. Um, it's also in print. Um, which yeah. it's important. Um, there's one, my, my personal favourite Simonon novel, which is out of print at the moment, is called The Little Man from Archangel. Right. And uh, it's about uh, a, the, 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 uh, Jonas Milk, it's the central character, and he's a, he has a stamp collecting shop, not unlike the shop in uh, Mullis in my own book. <laughs> um, and uh, he lies about the whereabouts of his wife one day and if this tiny event leads to mm-hmm. every other event in in the novel and you know that's that's what Simonon does for me is like he takes a, a really small often insignificant event and he just teases out his narrative from that from that one incident and it's about how does this impact on the character or some act that they, they they may have committed without any great forethought and you know the, the little man from Archangel is a really good example of that um, uh, you know, there's some there's some really obscure ones like um, the magician, which is about an alcoholic aging magician, magician, and uh, the writing in that is just phenomenal. Yeah. And yeah, it's almost entirely unknown here. Yeah. So there's there's lots of gems to discover. I mean, you wrote hundreds and hundreds of. 
Well, I, I, yeah, I think I, I, I think it's about two hundred. But he also wrote a hundreds under assumed names. Yeah. So um, it, you know, maybe five hundred novels, but I think about two hundred odd under his own name. That's incredible. Which is just amazing, and there are there, there is the odd you know duffer. I'm sure. And yeah. I've read a few, but um, as I say, the quality you know is is really incredible, and he was a. I mean, that, the, the thing I always want to say about Stephen Owens, we always end up talking about how fast he wrote, how many no- mm. novels he wrote. But actually, and even in, you know, I've read the biographies, and the biographies, they tend to say, oh, he was living in, in, in the such and such a place in this year, and he wrote X, Y, Z novels. But you, there's never really much, uh, people don't go into the novels yeah. as individual works of fiction. Um, in any detail, because you know you, there isn't time, because there's so many of them, mm-hmm. and I tend to think that if if Simonon had written ten novels, he would be regarded as one of the very greatest writers of yeah. the twentieth century. You know, far to me, he's a far superior writer to Camus right. or Sartre. Uh-huh. You know, but we, we we lose sight of the quality of his best work because there's so much yes. of the work. Uh, yeah. We don't, you know, if we were, that's if, often the case. Isn't yeah. It? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Camus. Oeuvre as a novelist is very slim. Yeah, you know, and basically three books really, with mm-hmm. some other sort of versions of, and uh, you know, I I don't particularly rate the fall, mm-hmm. as I reread it recently. I'm like, mm, yes, this is not great. Well, I mean, Chalky's uh, really comes down to Young Adam and you yeah, know, Kane's book, I suppose. Which, yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, um, which I've never finished. And yeah. uh, um, and then some kind of. Helen and Desire. Yes. yes. I've read that. <laughs> well, you have to do that. Yeah. But I think you're right. I think mm. that, that uh, in a way it's great because obviously it allowed him to keep going yeah. and he loved writing and all yeah. those things. But yeah, sometimes, you know, having a one or two that yeah. kind of hit the mark. I mean, when I, yeah, I mean, you can cut all this out if you want, but I, mean, I started writing a blog um, before my first novel was published and I was going, my plan was to write a blog about every one of Simonon's Roman Dure, so about 120. Um, and uh, and I just want, and the, the, the idea behind it was just to sort of give a little bit of attention to each of the books yeah. individually. You know, and, you know, not pretend that they're all masterpieces, but just say, what is this book about? You know, what's it doing, etc. I mean, I haven't really had time to keep it up. I got about 25 books in. Oh, that's good. Um, they're all still up online. Okay, um, excellent. Now, the, one of the reasons I asked was for that very reason. I'd read a, um, a few of the May Grey books, mm-hmm. my dad's into them, um, and that was about it. And then you say, well, what else is there? And then you mm-hmm. look and you go, well, blind, you have no yeah. idea where yeah, to yeah. start. Oh, people are always asking me, you know, where should I start? Because it's like so intimidating. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Penguin are reissuing some of the non May Grey books at the moment, and uh, you know, there are certain ones which have been kind of canonised, you know, like The Blue Room, mm-hmm. The Stain on the Snow, which I don't like so much, but it's, you know, often regarded as one of Simonal's best books. Um, Monsieur Ear, which was made into a, an amazingly good film uh, by Patrice Leconte. Oh, right. Um, about 1990 or something, great film. Of the same um, name? Uh, but the book is variously translated as Mr. Monsieur Ear's engagement or okay. uh, the engagement um, or Monsieur Ear. So I've started reading Simonon books with different translated titles before getting a third way through thinking, <laughs> I've read this one before. <laughs> He's um, really repeating himself. I know, but then you, do get, you do get that sense. And he said, uh, it's a brilliant quote, he said, his big novel was a tapestry of all, a mosaic of all its small novels. Yeah, right. And I love that idea. And it's a bit like, I think, you know, a writer like Raymond Carver, he mm-hmm. had his terrain. Yeah. And although he didn't write a novel, you feel that his characters all inhabit the same world. Yeah, and it's so, a world that you create. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, there are a lot of really great writers who just have their turf. And they, you know, Simonon is at his best for me in, in sort of small town, France, Holland, Belgium you know, small towns and villages, um, describing sort of provincial outsiders. Uh, in a way, not um, unlike Raymond Carver, I suppose. Yeah. You know. Um, if we can talk a little bit about his bloody project. Yes. Uh, so, for those who don't know, and can't be many, I don't think, um, it became shortlisted on The Man Booker last year. It did. And I take it um, everything just went a bit mad after that. So I, what, what, tell us a little bit about what happened because I'm interested to know. Well, um, yeah, I mean, as you say, everything went 
completely mad and my world was transformed not even when the book was shortlisted but when it was longlisted um, and you know at that time I wasn't a full time writer I was making my living or most of my living by doing bits of editing work and by doing painting and decorating jobs and I was actually uh, when I got the phone call to tell me that was on the long list I was actually painting the ladies toilet of an accountant's office in Kilmarnock <laughs> um, so I had to go and tell the people who are employing me that I'm going to have to take the rest of the day off because I've been long listed for the Booker Prize, which probably yeah. sounded a bit yeah. odd oh, coming from their painter and decorator. Yeah, from my wife yeah. locked herself out or yeah, something yeah, like that. They were, they were like, a... yeah, right, all right, <laughs> at least it's original. Um, so, yeah, and then, you know, from the very beginning, uh, you know, the, the attention from publishers abroad and obviously it has a, an immediate effect on the sales of your book. Mm. Um and then it, we go on to the shortlist. I say we because I feel like I've, this was something I was doing with Sarah Hunt, my yes, publisher, sure. you know, which was very much part of the story because of the small publisher. And I always find myself saying we because we were a team. I understand that, um, I think, yeah. Uh, so we got on the shortlist and then it just gets racked up to another level. Um, you're involved in all sorts of fantastic events and reading to, you know, a thousand people. And so the, this at the moment was just after being on the long list? Well, the, the long list brought a lot, a lot of attention in terms of publishers abroad. Right. But then the sort of, the official booker events are mostly for the shortlisted authors. Um, so it's just, it's, you don't realise until you're inside it that it's just, it's an incredibly massive thing with a worldwide, you know, reach. And I think especially because I was an author who was pretty much unknown. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're J.M. Coetzee, you already have deals with publishers around the world. Of course. So I was, you know, a new kid on the block and the, the, the aspect that the book was sort of a crime novel generated a lot of interest mm -hmm. as well um, but it just it brings your book to an, an audience that doesn't know about it I mean yeah. up to that time it, it might have sold a thousand copies it wasn't doing very well and um, that suddenly it's on the front you know it's, it's on the front table of Watterson's and I know how important that is because I've worked in bookshops yeah um, of course and uh, people have the opportunity to to make a decision about whether they want to buy it or not. I mean, what's been really nice is that, given that it's now all exa exactly a year since, you know, I didn't win the Booker Prize. You know, the book has continued to have a life. Um, mm -hmm. It's still it's still so you know sizable amounts of copies. So it took the Booker to bring it into pu the public sphere. But I like to think you know it sustained itself beyond that. Yeah, uh, which is. You know, but the main thing is it just gives you a, a you know, platform as a writer. I can be a full time writer now for yeah. you know the foreseeable future, um, and that's you know, I'm sure any writer will tell you how hard it is to make a living from the sales of you know his or her books. I mean, and nearly every writer that we have interviewed, and there's been a few now, and, mm -hmm. and I know absolutely that it's it's almost impossible. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. That. So that's I mean, it's a, you know, it's a huge privilege, and you know. I've been invited abroad and I've done a lot of travelling and, you know, when the, your book starts to travel, that's another, you see, you then begin to see your own book through the eyes of people from different countries. Yeah. And that's a, you're just an amazing experience because they have their own take on it because, and they, they relate, you know, my book about, you know, characters in a Highland village in 1869, they relate it to, you know, episodes in the history of China or episodes, you know, the relationship between Aboriginal people and colonial settlers in Australia and so on. So, you know, it's that's yeah. really fascinating. I remember when I was um, uh, teaching at, at Glasgow and we, we, we Glasgow University and we would often get overseas students, particularly from the Far East, who had been inspired to at least take a Scottish mm. literature course from reading, and it was reading rather than the film, um, train spotting and you think well yeah. how yeah. how is that kind yeah, of thing yeah. but they really there's something about those characters that they mm -hmm. seem to buy into yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and I don't think I don't think you can write to do that to achieve that no, deliberately no. I think you have to write you know write your story striving for some sort of I hate even hate using the word universality mm -hmm. I think you I strive for the particularity of the story and the, the setting and the characters and but it's so that's why when it when people in different situations find a resonance in it, it all feels more remarkable. I didn't. It, I was certainly wasn't trying to achieve that, and I, you know, I don't think you can. 
Um, but yeah, that's... Um, so uh, when yourself and Sarah had found out that this was happening, was uh -huh. it completely out of the blue? I mean, how, I guess, how does it happen? How do, does your book get um, picked up? Is it just well, luck? Or? I mean, publishers are allowed to, publishers or imprints yeah. uh, are allowed to submit, basically submit one book per imprint. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so Sarah, you know, and this is great, Sarah decided to submit um, his bloody project as the Saraban book for that year. She told mm -hmm. me that she was going to submit it. Yeah. And, um, you know, in all honesty, part of me laughed. Mm -hmm. But part of me thought, all right, why not me? Yeah. You know, yeah. why not my book on the long list? I didn't think... Mm -hmm. I, and, and the reason I thought that was because of the unusual structure of the book. Yeah. I thought, if you're going to read 150 novels, as the judges do, I think Something his bloody project will at least... They will at least notice it and, uh, you know, begins with a preface written as sort of a bit of literary journalism, almost in that style, with footnotes. It's, it's unusual. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, so I thought, you know... Why not? Yeah. Having said that, I completely forgot about it. And, <laughs> uh, you know, Sarah was, um, Sarah had forgotten which day the announcement was going to be yeah. made. So she'd forgotten about it as well. And the day she phoned me, I'd actually left my phone at home. So I clearly wasn't in any way aware. Waiting um, on the call. Totally not. Uh, I mean, with some, you know, with say, say I thought maybe... It was, you know, the Saltire Prize that year. I sure. thought this is a book which might be of interest to mm -hmm. judges of Saltire Prize because it's a very Scottish book and etc. The McIlvany Prize for Scottish Crime, which I didn't get on the long list. Yeah. But, you know, so you can't um, exactly. predict. But yeah, I would have thought I might have been in there with a shout for those prizes. With the new book, you know, I don't feel like that's a book that would get on the Booker shortlist. Not because I don't think it's as good or whatever, but it doesn't have that sort of it doesn't have the sort of obvious literary whistles yes. and bells that you, you might mean, associate yes. with literary fiction. I'm making inverted commas. Yes, just in case <laughs> that, yeah. Should uh, point that out. But yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it came completely out of the blue for yeah. me. And I, you know, I, I told the people I was decorating for that I'd be back in a couple of days to finish I the job. And it's, it's still waiting to get finished. It's still waiting. <laughs> that, that wallpaper is still unhung. Could you um, see, you know, when people are, you were saying how, you know, when the book was out and it was selling and it maybe sold a thousand or something like that, right. that's kind of yeah, half yeah. of the norm of a book in Scottish novel, you know. Exactly. I mean, yeah, it is. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, I think Adele Bado had sold a thousand or fifteen hundred copies. That's, and that's a respectable... Mm -hmm benchmark for a debut novel and this is why it's so so difficult for a, a writer to yeah, make a living and the writers make their livings through teaching and creative writing courses chairing events uh yeah, you know ed editing okay. work and so on or copy editing all these sort of so you have a little sort of i mean in a way writing the writing of a novel is almost an advert for your skills yeah and you, and you get employed to do other stuff um and it you know it's you know a lot of people who are employed in the literary industries, you know, giving out money to authors, they make far, of course they make far, far more money than the authors who are scrabbling around for the crumbs from the table of the funding bodies, yeah, you know. Of course. And there's, there's some, sometimes there feels like an imbalance in that. Yes, you know, Because absolutely. these bodies exist to support uh, creative people, yeah, um, not necessarily support people who work in the industry to support creative people. Yes, yeah, I know exactly um, what you mean. So, yes. the, the, uh, the balance is not quite. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I'm not obviously we need funding bodies and people need to be paid to work in them. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it's 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 very difficult, and um, uh, you know, that's in a way why one of the reasons literary prizes are, I think, important mm -hmm. I mean, because they can bring novels that have gone under people's radar. To people's attention. Yeah. So, after um, I suppose it didn't really calm down. I presume it's still mm. been pretty crazy. <laughs> I, I, I kept thinking it was. I thought it would calm down after the actual ceremony this time last year, um, and I did. Um, I did have a few months of relative quiet, but then I had a lot of trips abroad in the early part of this year, mm -hmm. um, and I thought after that it would calm down. And it still has. I mean, I'm planning, I'm currently juggling events for, you know, February, March, April, ne May next year, you know, and I'm saying, no, I can't do that because I'm going to Latvia, you know, I'm going to India in, in, in February, you know, so it's like, it, I mean, I, I, I get 
invitations every day. And, uh, you know, it's I do find it quite hard to say no, but I'm yeah. going to have to start being... I'm really trying to carve, to carve out some time to write, which yeah. is actually why I get what invited to places, yeah. you know. So, um, so when this was all kind of at its peak, had you already written the accident? Or was Luckily, uh, just before I started this particular decorating job, I'd just finished the first draft. So, I mean, for me, the first draft is getting to the end of the story, having, you know, I know the characters now, and of course it's a big mess, but it was there, the skeleton of the book was mm-hmm. there. And I think that was amazingly helpful yeah. um, because it was good to have a break from it and as well because you can go back with a fresher eye on it. Um, but also, I didn't have to decide what am I going to write now because I was already so yes. far into, um, you know, into the accident. And, you know, you don't want to be having these thoughts of, oh, what, what, should, what should I do now to follow That's up this successful what I wondered, book? Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, I think um, all these external thoughts about what you should write or what would please people mm-hmm. are really detrimental to to go back to the existential terminology, a sort of authentic crea- creative process. Yeah. You know, you, you just have to put all these thoughts out of your mind. Like, okay, this is a book I want to write. For yeah. people who read, who read His Bloody Project, they're not going to expect... A sort, of, a sort of detective novel no. set in France as the next book. But, well, actually, that's what I want to write. So, yeah. um, you know, that's what I have to write. Because if I wasn't to write and I was to choose to write something else, then it would be, it would be to some extent, be a sort of cynical, calculating yeah. process. And, you know, one of the nice things, one of the many nice things about the success of His Bloody Project is, of course, it brought a bigger audience to disappearance of Adele Bado. Yeah. And I generally, I mean, of course, people are generally polite and don't tell you if they hated <laughs> your book, unless they're, you know, literary critics or something, they just write in the paper. But um, generally speaking, people who've gone who've, to Adele Bado after His Bloody Project have really enjoyed the book. Yeah. And um, there are lots of people who think it's a better book. And I love that. Yeah. Because it's a much quieter book. Yes. And it's a much less, obviously, literary book. Yeah. Although, as far as I'm concerned, it's equally as literary. It's a book about characters, and yeah, um, I was I was in Paris um, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> it sounds so glamorous. It was <laughs> it actually was glamorous, and um, uh, and I, I suddenly thought of um, his bloody project as the Pompidou Center. The Pompidou Center has yes. all, you, the structure of the building is on the outside. Yeah, and his bloody projects like that, you can see the structure of the book. It's very manifest as you turn yeah. the pages. I, mean, I think that's one of the great things yeah. about it. Yeah, you yeah. can see. I mean, you yeah. can see that if you know, if you know your Scottish writing, not just Scottish writing, but other writing mm. as well, you can see that and go, mm-hmm. "Oh, yeah, that's got a bit of that, it's got a bit yeah. of that." Um, yeah. But I think, it's like you were saying earlier on, you know, you don't want to over- hit, you know, smack people around the head no. with these things, but no, it's no. there if you're no, willing no, to was, look. That for was it. just the, that was part of the conception of the book. Yeah, but the other books are equally as structured it's just that the structure is kind of invisible in a more yeah. sort of normal novelistic way so i think people would think oh that, that these other books are very easy to write they're actually much much more difficult mm-hmm. to write and the accident is easily the most difficult book i've written yeah um you know because i didn't know what was going to happen i had to find the characters i didn't have a story so it, you know you really uh you don't have much to go on whereas his bloody pro uh, project it was it's kind of high concept as they say in the yeah. tv business um it was high concept in terms of its structure and just the concept of a murderer writing his his own account of the events leading up to the murders is in a way quite high concept i mean do you um, think do you ever think yourself i'm writing in a tradition of you know european uh, 20th century literature or I'm now writing in a, a tradition that or, or is it not as I think about it people I don't mean to sound cynical no, at no, all no 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 but, but yeah, I, you, I certainly didn't before because mm-hmm. you don't you certainly don't you know what um, I don't know I, I don't like to make my process self-conscious and I yeah. try I deliberately try not to think about it but then of course it, that's easy when you're writing your first novel and it's not been published because you yeah. know N- nobody, nobody talks to you about what you've done. Yes. Um, 
and uh, it's but that become it becomes harder to maintain that naive position towards your own stuff later when people like yourself ask you questions about <laughs> it. I mean, and you, you're, you, both you and a guy in Germany called uh, Robert Wirth, uh-huh. uh, who's a sort of a young academic over there, um, you know, wrote reviews of his bloody project with placed it, you know, so solidly within the tradition of Scottish lit, mm-hmm. Scottish fiction, the Scottish novel. And, you know, I was reading both these pieces of work, like, wow, that's amazing. I, I draw so heavily on all these books I've never read. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, uh, yeah. That's but but the, it's, the actually, it's actually more interesting that, I mean, I've, I've read some of, that, some of that stuff and not read House Growth Green Shutters, for yeah. example. I've never read it, right. but I can totally see how his bloody project resonates with it. Mm-hmm. And it, it becomes much a much more interesting thing when, even although I haven't read some of this literature, the book that I've written chimes with it and yeah. you start thinking, oh, is there something here in the sort of Scottish psyche and I'm repeating these tropes that uh, from, you know, 200 years of Scottish writing. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, but, you know, if I had to be self-conscious about it, I, I would, the stuff that I um, consciously influenced by is European stuff. Yeah. Simenon, Dostoevsky, Kafka. Yeah. Um, that that if that's a tradition, then yes, I mean, but obviously I'm not putting myself in that bracket, no, you know. No. But you know, that's the stuff that I feel is sort of at the back of my mind when I'm writing, and that's uh, what you love to read. That's what I love to yeah, read. That's yeah, that's what it sure. comes across yeah. definitely. Um, so now that. I mean, you've probably answered this already, so there's not any kind of uh, pressure that you feel that you think, well, I've got to follow up this successful novel. Um, well, there is, more, there is more pressure because, yeah. you know, the first two books weren't really reviewed and, um, no, you know, they weren't prominently displayed in the bookshops. And, um, you know, with this book, because of the success of His Bloody Project, it will be reviewed mm-hmm. and, you know, um, uh, people want to come and do interviews with mm. me. So it's going to get more attention and that brings a pressure and I feel like, you know, it's a it's a book on a sort of smaller scale and I worry that, you know, its shoulders aren't big enough to take the weight of this kind of attention. Um, and again, it's not by saying it's on a smaller scale, I don't think that's a lesser scale no. because just like talking about Raymond Carver, he wrote about tiny incidents but there, most people would except Raymond Carver is a, is a great writer, yeah. you know, but, you know, it's, that's the, I love stuff about the minutiae of life, and, you know, Simenon said, says something in one of his novels, you begin from the details and build to the general picture. Um, so, yeah, but there's nothing, you can't do anything with the pressure, you know, um, you have to be happy that your book is going to get the attention it's going to get, because every writer I know would love to have that attention. And, um, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. I mean, I, you know, uh, you just, you just, you, you write your book and it, out it goes into the world. And, yeah. um, you know, probably like uh, seeing your son or daughter off to university, they hope they don't misbehave too badly <laughs> <laughs> or something, you know. Um, uh, I should also say as well that, you know, Sarah Hunt, my publisher, uh, has always been uh, sort of, uh, she's always sort of managed me really, really well and t- done everything she can to sort of take the pressure off my shoulders. And she was the one who said, you know, you don't need to write anything, take some time off, you know, don't feel any pressure. And it, the only person that wanted to get this book finished and out this year was me because I was already, uh, you know, I'd already had the first draft. So I was eager to get it finished and not let it just sort of, linger on mm-hmm. um, and I want to move on as well to something else so I uh, yeah. I, well, I thought that I wonder we're actually having a publisher like yeah. Sarah I wonder if you had uh, other publishers they might think right we need well I think that's very know, possible um, so yeah our bloody project or something yeah yeah, like yeah. well yes somebody suggested something <laughs> like that yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah I'll get the ghostwriter in for that um, but yeah no uh, yeah I think these having a a good relationship with your publisher or your agent or whoever. Yeah, sure. It's important to have somebody who you feel understands you as a person as opposed to just seeing you as a sort of content provider. Yeah, <laughs> um, absolutely. Um, and with something as successful as that, has there been any interest in 
making it into television or film or anything like that? Well, we sold the, um, we actually had sold the film or screen rights before the Booker Prize came along. Oh, right. Um, which, you know, at the time was, you know, uh, you feel the book needs a sort of a bit of a fill up and yep. selling film rights creates a bit of a buzz around yeah, the book. Yeah, of course. Uh, so it was bought by a small production company in Glasgow called Synchronicity. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I did work in television for a few years, so I, I'm all too aware of the great length of time yeah. that anything uh, like that takes. Uh, also, I mean, now I'm really glad that the book its, has its own life in, in its own right because I think when people watch a sort of screen adaptation, you can't unsee it yes. when you go to the book. So the, the setting and the characters are there, visually there for you. So your engagement with the book is a bit different. So I'm glad that people have read the book or... You know, yeah, a re- quite a reasonable number of people sure. have read the book, uh, you know, and come to it on their own terms. If something happens in a few years, uh, that you know, that'd be great. Um, but um, you know, I'm not holding my breath. Um, we'll see. <laughs> um, well, I think that's the perfect place to call it. A day. <laughs> Thanks very much, Ben, for that's talking good. to us. Always good to talk to you. And uh, we'll be back soon um, with someone completely different. Cheers. Mm.